Stanford University. Welcome everyone to the panel on transportation. So my name is Marco Pavone. I've been the moderator for this panel. The goal of this panel is to discuss uh, the path to decarbonization with a focus on uh, transportation. Uh, I'm a professor of aeronautics and astronautics and also of uh, computer science and electrical engineering by CARTC. And my research is on uh, uh, algorithms for decision making for autonomous systems such as the self-driving vehicles, and also algorithms to coordinate future mobility systems, whereby, for example, mobility is provided by potential electric uh, autonomous vehicles. So the panel, uh, at the beginning, I will ask the speakers to introduce themselves. And then uh, we'll have about half an hour, where I will ask uh, speakers a number of uh, questions related to the topic of uh, electrification of the transportation system and decarbonization. And then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end where we'll, be, we'll open up the discussion to the entire audience. I think the topic is extremely exciting. I just want to mention that uh, Ram and I are in the process of launching a new center on sustainable mobility. And the topic that we're going to discuss today is going to be one of the fundamental research pillars for this center. Uh, I am uh, uh, honored to be joined in the panel by three uh, very influential uh, thinkers on the topic of uh, sustainable transportation. Professor Ram Rajakopal, Professor uh, Susan Handy, and Dr. Anand Gopal. And then I will ask each of you to introduce yourself. Let's start from the left-hand side. So Ram, maybe you can go first. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am a faculty in the Civil Environmental and Electrical Engineering Departments at Stanford. And my work specifically on the transportation area focuses on how can we get the electric grid ready to support all of the um, electrification goals for transportation that we have set up ourselves up for. And we look into two areas. One is uh, planning and how to project the impact of massive electrification into the grid. And the other one is how to coordinate grid resources at, with the transportation management and uh, enable a much more uh, faster transition. Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Handy. I'm a professor at UC Davis in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy and also the acting director of our Institute for Transportation Studies, otherwise known as ITS Davis. So I was asked to say a little bit about Research, Please. transportation research in yeah. California now? Absolutely. Okay. That would be great. Um, so, uh, California is, I think everybody would agree, a, a real powerhouse, no pun intended, when it comes to transportation research. And ITS Davis is right there in the center of it. My colleague Dan Sperling, uh, who some of you may know because he does the energy work, but I don't. Um, he likes to claim that ITS Davis is the leading university research center on sustainable transportation in the world. So you have a lot of competition for your new center. Um, but really what also makes- Also collaboration, of course. Yes, collaboration. collaboration. Exactly. Uh, and what makes the transportation research in California so powerful is the collaboration. A little friendly competition, but a lot of um, very good collaboration among the universities in the state. So I was just gonna mention that we are a part of the uh, what's called the University of California Institutes of Transportation Studies. So we partner with Berkeley, UCLA, and Irvine. And we manage a state program called the State Transportation Research Program. There's a similar program for the Cal State Universities um, that's managed out of San Jose State at the Mineta Institute. And then we also at Davis lead what's called the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, which is a part of the Federal University Transportation Centers Program, which is a really nice pot of money for research and education in transportation. Um, and as a part of the NCST, as we call it, we partner with USC, Cal State Long Beach, UC Riverside, as well as Vermont, uh, Georgia Tech, and um, Texas Southern University. And then, just to make it even more complicated, we're also a part of the Pacific Southwest Region University Transportation Center, 
which is also a part of this federal program. And that is led by USC. And we, Berkeley and UCLA, are a part of that. So we are networked in very many ways, though not so much um, with Stanford. And should I say a little more about what we do? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. OK. So um, a lot of what we do is to support policy transformation around the goal of equitable decarbonization. We are not so much at Davis doing technology work. We do a little of that, but really we're a lot about policy. And so we do work like building tools to help support policy development and implementation. And if anybody's interested, I can talk about our induced travel calculator, which has caused quite a kerfuffle in the state. Um, we develop policy instruments. We're quite proud of our contribution to the low carbon fuel standard um, for the state of California, uh, evaluation studies, basic research. And um, I guess one of the points I want to make, and I'll have more time to do that, I think, is that while we are doing a lot of work in support of the state's efforts to electrify transportation, both passenger transportation and freight, um, we know that that's not enough to get the state towards its goals. So we also do a lot of work around the goal of reducing vehicle miles of travel, otherwise known as VMT. So that's where my work resides, and I can talk more about that. Great. Anand? Great. Uh, so I'm Anand Gopal. I'm uh, free of any university at the moment, so I'm happy to say that I have no, uh, no friendly competition with anybody. I'm um, looking forward to, to uh, cooperation with everyone. Uh, I um, do have connections to universities. I have a PhD from Berkeley's Energy and Resources Group, so uh, the other university across the bay, as it's referred to over here. Um, and for about a couple of decades, I worked on various aspects of clean energy and climate policy analysis. Um, right now, I run a climate policy think tank known as Energy Innovation. Energy Innovation is a policy research firm. And what we try to do is try to, re to inform the best and most impactful policy decisions to reduce the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions at the speed and scale required by the climate problem. Um, so we tend to work backwards from where uh, policymakers are looking for important technical research to solve or put forward uh, design ideas and in some cases legislation, in many cases just regulations, um, where we can like massively reduce emissions. As a result, a lot of our work is in China and the United States. Um, and a lot of our work in the last couple of years um, has been to do technical research and modeling for the US federal push on climate policy. So our team, along with um, some others in the private sector as well as in universities, did. Uh, our, we were one of the three main groups doing modeling of the entire Inflation Reduction Act and all of the policy provisions and what we're going to see in terms of climate uh, benefits, as well as jobs, uh, GDP, public health, and equity benefits that come from acting on climate. So that's the summary of what my team does. We have programs in, uh, across sectors using modeling for all energy-related sectors. And we have specific programs in electricity, transportation, and industry. Uh, and so I'm here to, to, to discuss some of our work in transportation, but we also cover a lot of the other energy sectors. And uh, very excited to be part of this panel. I have been connected with both of these folks in a Far, far past in history. So that's also kind of funny to show up here and see you all and honored to be part of this. That's great. All right, so let's get started uh, with the conversation. And uh, electrification is usually discussed as uh, one of the technologies or the technology that is key in pursuit of decarbonization. But Susan just stated that uh, electrification is not enough. So what else should we be doing? You mentioned a reduction of VMT. Would you mind elaborating a little bit more on that point? Yeah, sure. So the state's own analysis out of the California Air Resources Board shows that um, while electrification is essential to meeting the state's goals, we can't do it fast enough to get to where we need to be. Um, so that means we've also got to think about reducing how much everybody drives. We need to 
reduced VMT, and the state has policy around reducing VMT as well. And you know, I think it's important to remember also that um, electrification doesn't solve all the problems, right? Cars in and of themselves are problematic in many ways. We can talk about tires, for example. Um, roadways themselves, um, and so on and so forth. So even if we could instantly electrify um, our passenger and freight transportation system, there'd be a lot of other work that would need to be done. Um, so we're doing some of that um, kind of work. And uh, I think in, you know, the electrification is hard enough, but trying to get people to think about driving less is maybe our biggest challenge of all. Um, harder, perhaps, than getting people to stop smoking. So, uh, so the state is also putting a lot of energy into um, that effort, and uh, we are assisting them in various sorts of ways. <laughs> Can you elaborate a bit more on uh, the legislation that is being considered in order to incentivize the reduction of VMT? Yeah, so there, there are two critical pieces of legislation, I would say. One is Senate Bill 375, which dates back to, um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to get the years right, 2008, something like that. Um, and that put a requirement on the um, regional transportation planning bodies, which are called metropolitan planning organizations. So the MPO here is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and um, set targets for the MPOs in terms of um, reductions in VMT. And it's, I think that that policy has been perceived as not entirely successful. Um, it it uh, created a lot of energy around, energy, use that word here, uh, effort around, um, you know, thinking about regional plans and analyzing regional transportation plans with respect to what they were going to mean for greenhouse gas emissions in the future. Um, but the problem is that to reduce vehicle miles of travel, we need action by local government. And uh, these MPOs have no power over land use planning and what the local governments do. So there's been sort of a disconnect there. Um, where there's a lot of activity right now at the state level and at the local levels is around Senate Bill 743, which also dates back quite a few years but is taking some time to implement. Um, but that's one that now requires under the California Environmental Quality Act that transportation projects as well as land development projects, any kind of project subject, subject to CEQA, um, that the transportation impacts are going to be evaluated with respect to their impact on vehicle miles of travel, since that is really the key driver, pun unavoidable there, um, for the environmental impacts of transportation. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of scrambling now to figure out how exactly do we, do we analyze potential VMT impacts. Um, but in the meantime, a lot of push by the state um, towards actions at the local level that would help to reduce dependence on cars. So, and I can go on and on. You can. I have actually somebody. quite a bit okay. of follow-up questions. That, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, All right. Uh, let me just like a we're little bit of wrap back up because and, I do have and, quite a few okay, questions. So, I'm sure that the people here yeah, have a so, bunch of so questions. Lots of lot. It affects all of us. So. Right. Action at the local level around. Of course, investing in things like walking and biking, transit, huge issue right now. I mean, that's one of our big alternatives to driving. Um, but land use policy, and in particular, housing. So the last point I'll make now is that our transportation problem is fundamentally a housing problem. Yeah, that's a good statement. Great. And as I said, I have quite a few follow-up questions. <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of people have follow-up questions. But let me uh, uh, continue this conversation about electrification more from the technology side. So you said that even if electrification is going to happen overnight, but we know that that is not going to happen. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, a lot of significant uh, infrastructural upgrades are needed in order to meet uh, the increased demands. And perhaps paradoxically, these infrastructural upgrades 
potentially might delay our decarbonization goal. So I was wondering if Ram could uh, elaborate a bit more on this topic. Yeah, I think one of the uh, biggest challenges right now for transportation decarbonization is that any option, not just electric vehicles, even if you think of other options like hydrogen and so on, they depend on electric power for the production of the fuel. And when you look at the impact of, for example, in the state of California, of the established adoption curves that we have for fleets and passenger vehicles and so on, um, you will require something like replacing 70% of the transformers in the state by 2040. And transformer replacement is something that used to take maybe three to four months. Now timelines can exceed a year, depending on where you are. And the rationale for a lot of this is that we tend to think of the transportation system, the electricity grid, as all completely independent parts. Exactly, even if you think about you know, transportation in old times, you, know, you would go to, nobody really is worried about, am I going to have gas to fill the tank? You know there's gas stations, there are many different options, and you can go and fill it up. So a person designs the car and designs, uh, manages the fleets and so on without necessarily accounting for that. Um, but with electrification, you have to start thinking about it as a system. Because if things operate completely independently, you end up having to replace 70% of the transformers, and most likely you're going to miss all the state targets. But instead, if you started thinking about the possibility of coordination between the infrastructure of the grid and the management of the transportation, you can start to match your supply and demand much, much better locally. And once that starts to happen, we have uh, shown in a recent research paper that was published in, in June last year that you can basically go from replacing 70% of transformers to something like 30%, which is a dramatic um, uh, change. Now, what are the challenges to make something like that happen? One piece is technology, as Marco said. You need much smarter kind of management of how you schedule your EVs and how, where, where they're going to go, where they're going to charge, and so on. You also need the infrastructure to be smarter and able to communicate and respond and engage with your electric vehicles, with the chargers, and so on. That's one piece. The other piece is policy. Right now, kind of the financial incentives and the pricing schemes that we apply on, on the sector are not really supportive of this coordination. There is no real incentive to enable it. So you need to change that as well. And third, I also think there is a big need for these different sectors to really get together. The automotive OEMs, the charging suppliers, and the companies that build charging networks, the policymakers and decision makers, because we find that once you try to put all of these systems together, there has to be a kind of this conversation that goes along digitally, you know, through, through standards, but also an understanding between these different parties of, of how to enable that. And I, I think that fundamental observation um, for me is that unless we do this, we are not going to meet what we set ourselves up to, to do. And um, how do we meet this? One of the things that from Stanford, we are just a university. We don't operate anything. And what we see as an opportunity for Stanford is to bring these players together to partner with other institutions like UC Davis, um, who, who I do read papers and uh, appreciate a lot of the work you guys do. You. So to, to create kind of this demilitarized zone where these conversations can happen, where we can identify which technologies need to be developed, where you, know, you can form kind of a consensus and try to accelerate and fix this problem. And right now, they, you know, having traveled the US and, and even South America and Asia, 
all eyes are on California to try to understand, OK, how is this going to happen here? Because the same issue is there in every grid I've visited. So, yeah. And uh, all the projects that we've discussed here could be even worse when we talk about trucks. Typically, we talk about a personal mobility. But of course, uh, freight transportation is a big contributor to emissions. And there, actually, the infrastructure gap problem might be even more severe. So I was curious if you could comment a little bit more on this aspect that sometimes is uh, overlooked in the conversations. Yeah, I mean, so transportation as a whole is the California's largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And for sure, passenger transport, personal vehicles, is a very big chunk of that. But an, a really important part of that, although not the majority, is our movement of goods around the state. Um, now, California, you got to take, um, we got to, I'll stay on the optimistic side for a couple of things. One is, thanks to some brilliant research from uh, this part of the Bay Area and other parts of the state and all over the world, batteries have made incredible progress. Such incredible progress that um, a lot of people were not sure what kind of solution sets we had available to decarbonize trucking. Now, we have some pretty clear solutions. Really, lots of classes of freight trucks can be directly electrified. There may be some open questions about the very heaviest freight trucks, but uh, the Tesla Semi is now on the road, and that's a class eight tractor trailer that can take goods 500 miles between charge. That's great, right? Um, and what we now need to figure out is stuff that we have taken all of our personal transportation charging needs, and now we have to figure out how to, to scale that up by uh, multiple scales and factors. The good news is California has two rules, the advanced clean truck rule and the advanced clean fleet rule. Both of those are leading, eventually, the outcome is that manufacturers and sales of trucks in the state have to be completely zero emission, all 100% of sales by 2036, with some fairly slow ramp up in the early years and much faster ramp up of shares of sales of zero emission trucks in later years. To make sure that that target is hit, uh, we have to, to, to couple that with good deployment of charging infrastructure and other forms of electricity generation if there's some level of hydrogen involvement here. Now, the reason this is a challenge and something that the state is paying attention to and really needs to step up on is for us to have enough chargers at the rate and speed that you can get for trucks to be a viable, practical alternative to diesel. And recently, there's been some efforts across a variety of different universities that have joined together, as well as um, standard setting agencies to come up with a, cha a charging standard called the Megawatt Charging Standard, MCS. Now, once MCS is hopefully final, we at least won't have the sort of issues we've had on the passenger vehicle side of some kind of balkanization with Chatamo taking off a little bit and then SAE, CCS combo coming in. And now it looks like most people are migrating to Tesla's NAC standard. We should probably avoid that, and that's the good news. Then the solution set is really about partnerships with utilities, this California uh, Energy Commission being able to spend some money on this, the federal incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act and everything else in order to deploy the charging infrastructure that's needed to be able to make trucks a viable solution set to electrify. I'll just close on one point. Um, I think zero emission standards should just be technology neutral, and that's how California has gone forward with it. It is um, hard enough to directly electrify trucks because of the sort of power needs at the very end of pipe. If you start having uh, efficiency penalties for the trucks on top of that with hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells, then you're sort of compounding your electricity power needs problems by factors of two or three. You need more power. So, um, trying to go as much as possible for the sake of the climate where we can directly electrify in trucking is a very good idea. Um, and it still needs to meet the driver's expectations and use cases. And that's why you need very fast charging. And um, while this maybe seem like a daunting problem, we actually at Energy Innovation think there's a several set of different sets of opportunities to make that viable from a policy standpoint. And we look to our... Uh, brilliant university colleagues here to come up with all the technical requirements and the 
and the, and the different entities that need to talk to each other and come up with the various um, communication standards and otherwise in order to make it real. Happy to have a conversation. So uh, as I mentioned before, let me follow up on the topic that uh, Susan mentioned about state leg legislation. And I did two follow-up questions. The first one, if you could elaborate a bit more about the timeline for uh, these two pieces of uh, legislation. And uh, second of all, if you could also comment uh, what is done outside of California in terms of uh, lessons uh, learned and alignment of goals and initiatives. Well, the, the second part of that is pretty easy, is that there's not, not a lot going on outside of California in the US, right? And so that's what's so exciting about being here doing this work is that California is, it's like a big experiment. And we are here helping that along and helping to study it and learn from that so that we can pass along those lessons <coughs> to other willing states, but also to the national level. Um, there's a lot to be learned from other parts of the world, and so we, we look there as well. Um, yeah, so the, I guess rather than legislation, I'd like to talk a little bit more about kind of what's going on at the state level now, which is that we, we've had these two policies about reducing vehicle miles of travel. Um, the state has been putting a, lo a lot of money into um, transit and bicycle and pedestrian facilities, for example, some of it using the, um, um, you know, the revenues from cap and trade. Um, but at the same time, as we have this, this goal of reducing how much people are driving, we are continuing to expand highways. So to me, this is one of the really big disconnects in California's transportation policy at the moment. All this effort to electrify. We have policy about reducing VMT, but we're still expanding highways. We know, the research shows very conclusively that expanding highways induces additional driving. And that's what the kerfluffle that I mentioned uh, earlier is all about is is estimating what those effects are and then how would we mitigate that, uh, which is really the state saying, we're going to keep widening highways and we're going to take some of the money and put it into a few pedestrian projects and a little bit of transit and then that'll, that'll solve the problem. But it's really not solving the problem. So that's, that's something I think we've really, we've really got to take on. And then, um, I said transportation, our transportation problem is fundamentally a housing problem. It's also fundamentally a pricing problem in that we underprice driving. Um, if you factor in um, the direct costs of driving, our gas taxes don't pay for that. There's a lot of other money that, that gets used to help support our driving system. And then of course, if you talk about the externalities of driving, even if it's electrified, we as drivers are not paying for that. We're not paying for that directly. And if we, if we change the pricing system, that's really that's how we know we could, we could better manage driving, reduce unnecessary driving, deal with the congestion problem, and, and help to meet our um, GHG reduction goals. But again, that's a really politically unviable thing to talk about. Um, Although MTC in the Bay Area had some listening sessions a couple months ago about the idea of um, uh, full lane tolling, all lane tolling. So 101, 880, where there's good parallel transit service, maybe what we need to do is make everybody pay to use that facility. And of course, that brings up issues about equity. Um, there are ways to address that if we do implement a pricing system. And uh, I guess another really important point to throw out here is that all these efforts about reducing VMT are also really good for equity because we know the, the most disadvantaged communities um, disproportionately feel the negative effects of our car-oriented transportation system. And it's also the biggest financial burden for them. So we need to be finding other ways to move people around. We need to be giving people options other than just driving. So 
Um, a quick follow-up. So you mentioned uh, all lane tolling and the associated uh, equity concerns. Do you envision here sort of revenue refunding schemes or how would you make sure that people from the lower segment of the population wouldn't, wouldn't be unfairly impacted? Uh, well, so a couple of ways you can address it. One is that if we toll the freeways, that's going to raise a whole lot of revenues that we can put into those alternatives, like transit, like investing in transit the way it needs to be invested in. Um, the other thing we can do is subsidize driving um, for lower income households who admittedly are often dependent on driving because the alternatives are just not good enough yet. So we've got this awkward situation where we're trying to get people to drive less, but we don't really have these alternatives. So some people are gonna have to continue to drive. Um, so we've got some experiments going on around the state with mobility wallets, uh, which work sort of like um, you know, food stamp subsidies where lower income households can qualify for um, a certain amount of money per month to go towards transportation that they could use to pay for gas, but also, or instead, um, to use for transit or bike sharing systems um, or the like. So that, that's a couple of ways that the equity concerns around pricing can be addressed. And uh, going back more on the technological side, so, so far we haven't talked about reliability yet, which is one of the key concerns around the uh, electrification. So I was curious, Ram, uh, can you share a little bit about your thoughts on how we can, could address uh, reliability issues for alternative forms of energy sources for you know, yeah. transportation? I, I think there is several um, challenges on that front. When you think about reliability, um, the idea is if I have to drive uh, a certain number of miles every day, how many days of the year am I able to accomplish the task um, and, and not prevent it from doing it due to some other issue? What are other issues? Uh, first, we are already seeing here in California various climate and uh, related outages of the electricity grid. If the grid is not on and you have an electric vehicle, maybe you don't have a way to charge it. And so that's one reliability issue. The second is the reliability of the infrastructure itself. We discovered, for example, here on the Stanford campus, you know, when we look at all our chargers, about 30 to 40% of our charging guns are never working at any given time. So there's 30% chance you will go and try to charge your car with one of the chargers in the garage here, and it doesn't work. And once you have those issues, what are the kind of impacts you can have? Well, we had the chance to go and visit uh, AC Transit, and Jimmy Chan has coordinated a major project with them to assess different types of uh, transportation decarbonization options for buses. And what they found was super, you know, for me, was a, a big surprise, which is, well, if you just look at costs and everything, electric vehicle buses make absolute sense. It is definitely the most efficient from an energy standpoint, as Anand mentioned, and it's also simpler. But from a reliability standpoint, the day we visited there, they had 26 electric buses stranded for four months because they're not able to charge. And there's issues with the charger being compatible with the vehicle. Um, another issue was that PG&E that had guaranteed them grid allocation for, for installing a certain number of chargers said, well, that grid allocation was not available and it's going to take another X amount of time. And meanwhile, the much more expensive solution of hydrogen was working. And so that led them to change their decarbonization plan from 70% of the vehicles being electric into 70% being hydrogen. So reliability can play a gigantic role on fleets, for example. And I think, how do we achieve that level of reliability is, again, this issue of, uh, of systems thinking. A lot of what we have done now, I see as kind of the first generation of trying to electrify transportation. You, you built really good vehicles. Then you know folks are really good at power electronics, built chargers. And then folks that kind of are pretty good at deploying infrastructure went out there and did all of this. 
and things don't really work very well with each other. There were no standards and so on. And nothing was really built imagining a scale of millions of vehicles that need to operate at 99.99% reliability, which is kind of the expectation. You know, in what, if, you're, if you're AC transit, you're not going to buy, you know, 30% more buses and 40% more chargers just to make sure things work. So I think as we try to scale up, we're going to have to, on the technology side, start bringing in a lot more thinking around how reliability was incorporated into software and into computer systems. I think that's going to play a role. There's a lot of techniques and ideas and people who know that that need to work in this area. Second, I think we have to have a serious conversation about grid interconnection and making that work. And I think there's a huge policy and economics issue. Um, and, and third, I think all of this then plays into the equity side. Um, Stanford research from several faculty here has shown that the grid is a lot less reliable in low-income areas of the state. And if you look at that and you say, well, all those people, if they're going to rely on electric transportation, they're going to have a less reliable transportation service automatically. How is that even equitable? But, but I, I think there's a lot of hope if we focus on the right questions and the right goals. And I think it starts with, in my opinion, for this particular issue, we need data that is going through the system to be shared. We need standards, even to say, what, when is a charger working? There's no standard right now. There is, we have legislation that says you need a certain amount of uptime. There was no definition of uptime. Now everyone is scrambling to kind of go and define what is that. And of course, companies want to define it in a way that's good for them. But is that what us users of the transportation system think is the right metric for our experience? So for that, we need data. And that idea that data need to be shared to a certain extent, that, for example, in HC Transit, they discovered they needed data all the way from components of what is happening inside their vehicle to the charger, to the grid. And they are enforcing rules now that they only buy buses and equipment if you are willing to share that data. So, but those kind of practices need to be also um, shared among our community um, and to think about. And one last bit that I wanted to bring about uh, to, to, onto this discussion of DMT and economics is something that has been in my mind for a while, and it's also related to, 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 to equity. In not only the transportation system is changing, but the grid is also changing. If you look at the grid in California at 2040, there is massive amounts of solar that is curtailed. This is essentially power that we would pay you to consume. Then it makes me think, well, if I'm driving a vehicle that is using that energy, I'm actually generating a positive externality from an energy standpoint. Obviously, as Susan said, you know, the space for the highways and the lanes are going are gonna to be an issue. But if I look at 2040, what the energy sources tell me is that actually, well, if your car can absorb that power, you should drive more. You should use more energy because it's being thrown away. And it's also an opportunity to address equity issues because of all of that power that's thrown away, if it could be stored and, and utilized, and it could potentially create another revenue stream or, or mechanisms for um, cheap transportation. But I think unless we take a look at a systems viewpoint in all of this, we are not going to be able to scale. This is a big, big issue right now. And I see it at the CC level discussions. And I also see it at the academic level. Because typically, in, in very few places, maybe Davis and Berkeley, there's kind of some integration between decarbonization of transportation and people who actually look at transportation as a, you know design and roadways and tolls and all of that. But, but generally, these are two independent conversations that happen. And governed by different agencies. Governed by different agencies. And they never had to talk to each other. I mean, this, this is a completely new thing. So we discussed a lot about 
electrification, in, uh, incentivizing uh, behavioral changes toward uh, uh, reducing emissions. I was wondering, Anand, if you could comment a bit more broadly about uh, you know, policies and technologies that we could uh, envision uh, toward the goal of uh, reducing emissions from transportation. Yeah, thanks, Marco. So um, I, one of my side jobs is, to, is being on the board of the International Council on Clean Transportation. That's another sister think tank, kind of like Energy Innovation, who work exclusively on finding solutions on how to reduce emissions from transportation. And they work all over the world, and they've tried uh, several different approaches on what works best and what um, w doesn't work when it comes to rapidly uh, reducing emissions from transportation. And here we're referring primarily, no, almost entirely to greenhouse gases and other related air pollutants from tailpipes. And I'll have a little bit of a story for you, which is um, the, the, the general narrative is that uh, we owe a lot to the innovation of Tesla for the rate at which the electric vehicle transition has picked up in the US and then subsequently globally. And at the surface level, that is true. We do owe quite a lot to an, in, you know, to an innovative, upstart, disruptive company that challenges incumbents. If you look under the frunk, the EV hood, I guess, um, there's more to this story. The, the, in the, the success of Tesla through the entire teens, 2010 all the way to 2020, was it, the revenue from being a leader in innovating and selling electric vehicles due to the California original ZEV mandate that was put in place by the Air Resources Board by Chair Mary Nichols. Uh, and I know current Chair Leanne Randolph was here today, but um, we, and you know, and Assemblywoman Fran Pavley's bill was the one that led to that ZEV mandate in 2012. Um, quarter after quarter, all the way through that decade, the revenue from innovating and selling more electric vehicles than is necessary to meet the California ZEV mandate, selling those credits to laggards, car companies who thought EVs would amount to nothing, helped flip Tesla from loss to profitability and kept the company going before it became entirely more profitable in 2020 and after. So over and over, the lesson is very clear. In China, the uh, electric vehicle sales share today is something like 35%. How did that happen? It happened because China took some of the lessons from California's ZEV mandate and put in their own, called the New Energy Vehicle Program. Regulations are generally viewed in the United States as something that is uh, innovation inhibiting, requiring people to do something. But when regulation is cleverly designed and it impinges on the people who have the greatest agency to take action, like automakers, who know to make how to make electric vehicles, just didn't have the right motivation to make enough of them and spend their billions in advertising dollars to sell them, it can be innovation enhancing. And in transportation, regulations for requiring either reductions of tailpipe emissions like we have pending right now in the US EPA, or California's requirement for sales of zero emission vehicle shares each year, or both, which California also has tailpipe emissions requirements, combined can unleash and accelerate an energy transition and a transportation electrification transition that we need to happen faster than anything else in the history of transitions for us to meet climate goals. We did not need to require anything in order for internal combustion engines to take over from horse carriages. But that took 40 years, with plenty of pushback from the horse carriage companies. And we, we can't afford that luxury for climate. We have a physical problem that we're trying to meet. And in that sense, there is a little bit of an urgency, but the requirement and the salience of policy like we've pioneered in California, taken up by China, and then taken up by the European Union is absolutely critical and will continue to be critical even if we hit 30 plus percent shares of electric vehicles. And I'll also point out that we also agree that if you just rely on vehicle electrification, you do nothing else, you're still, you're gonna be hard pressed to meet 1.5 degrees C or any other such climate target. So everything, it's an and solution, uh, you know, looking at VMT reduction uh, or in the sense, enhancing people's ways of getting around and making their Everything commute. except highway building. And, right, instead of adding more roads, um, you will, um, you, 
all of those are needed in order for that transition. And California is a pioneer in that, and lots of other regions have taken it up. And the US EPA is, uh, under the Biden administration, really stepping up. But we'll see how it goes. There's still a lot more to be done with the same kind of policy instruments with trucks. Thank you. And I learned a lot for sure. We have time for about 10, 15 minutes of a Q&A. So I would like to open a discussion to the audience. And we're going to pass around the mic. So please wait for the mic before asking a question. So we have a first question over there and then a second one over there. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Michelina. I'm with the Public Advocates Office, part of the PUC. Um, my question is um, stems from a workshop I attended where um, several utilities at an EPIC workshop um, were talking about the difficulty of integrating electric vehicles on a service territory-wide scale into the grid, especially through, um, you know, sort of vehicle grid integration technologies. They were saying that customers um, voice privacy and security concerns around allowing utilities to essentially have access to um, what they see as personal data. Um, so I just wondered if any of you could speak to ways to sort of get past that hurdle, because you were talking about the need for you know, software and everything, and if, it, if there's a, a customer side inhibition to doing so, that could be a huge roadblock. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I think there is a, there's been many architectures for coordinating systems that have been demonstrated that don't require you to own the customer control nor know what he's doing. And in fact, even here at Stanford, we have a project that demonstrated that, but it's not a unique project. So th this is kind of, I wouldn't say it's a solved problem for EV charging, but there is lots of technologies that can be immediately applied and would essentially be a solved issue. I think the bigger question here is that for utilities right now, they make their money by rate-basing infrastructure investments. And when you set yourself up to that, what is the benefit for me to coordinate anything and prevent any infrastructure upgrade? There isn't really any benefit to that. But if you really want to align everybody, it's not about you know, thinking, oh, this guy is an enemy, that guy is this. I, I think it's, the advocacy should be towards, OK, let's reward a utility or whoever is involved in preventing the transformer upgrade, be it through software, be it through other mechanisms. Because once you are rewarding that, then everybody will align and follow that rule. I think this, this is the biggest issue. I think Susan mentioned pricing. I think this is really the issue here is how do you reward everyone for enabling coordination between consumers and the grid? And this is an issue definitely for EV charging, but also for all sorts of electrification, I think. There was a question over there. Thank you. Sam Maslin with Eddy Energy. Actually, you kind of had a similar question that was just asked, but just I've seen various studies around like the readiness or lack thereof of the distribution grid for very high V uh, situations, particularly when you think about like electric, you know, kind of uh, uh, long haul or medium haul trucks and all those getting charged in like, you know, warehouse districts that the load is incredible. So I mean, I guess from an infrastructure and or, you know, kind of let's coordinate better with our existing infrastructure, how ready or not, like what's the scale of the distribution upgrades we need for, you know, over the next couple of decades uh, for a sort of very high EV future? Yeah, I, can, um, I can take a shot of that. Um, I guess uh, just to put things in context, it is true that if you want to service um, load from the deepest levels of electrification we need to see, just, I mean, I'll complicate things first, then I'll try to make it simple. But, you know, we've got not just electric vehicles and passenger and trucks, but ideally what you want to do also in various different industrial districts is industrial heat processes also need to get electrified. So, you know, foresight and planning for where you already have existing processes that are amenable to electrification and having sort of utility um, 
planning in order to do that. You know, the PUC can ask utilities to do that, but they can also, there can be other agencies in the state that can pass policies to ask them to plan for that. If that happens, the rule of thumb in order for California by 2040, like over the next decade or so, there needs to be the distribution system upgrade um, in, in uh, investments need to be, I think, a factor of eight higher or something like that than they are currently. That's a rule of thumb, right? Um, so that's significant. Obviously, it's not happening fast enough. But what people are not recognizing is um, when you start looking at industry and finding solutions for industry, electricity plays a major role there. And the alternatives are not that great. Uh, and so therefore, being able to also plan for that will mean that you can, you can do a very good job of like preparing the state for its net carbon neutrality goal by 2045. So it's a big gap. There is poor planning at the moment. And there needs to be possibly legislative policy, at least, to address it. Yeah. So a lot of questions. I think uh, we have a question here in the front. Hi. Um, uh, Chris King with Siemens. Uh, first, a quick comment. Uh, we've all heard about the frog in the boiling water. And the water is starting to boil uh, as electricity rates hit 45 cents, which is equivalent to 450 a gallon of gas, which obviously has huge implications for uh, transportation electrification. My question, though, is around VGI. Um, and there, there's kind of two big flavors of that. There's V to B, B slash V to H, and then V to G. And uh, I guess our thesis is that the, the first one is going to deploy much more quickly and more easily because you don't have to involve the utility. You don't have to change any policies. Um, and you don't have that technical interconnection that you have to make. So I was wondering if you guys could comment on, on your outlook for VGI. Yeah, um, this is a great question. I think one of the, so, the technology has been demonstrated, experimented with, and what is the what are the uh, challenges right now? The first one is there is a still a lack of understanding of what is the impact on the battery system of the vehicle, and this information is owned by the OEM, uh, not even the battery. We talked to various battery manufacturers here as part of the Storage X program and. Kind of what we learned is even for them, they don't have access to that data. And that's an essential part of the calculus of how much is it worth for me to discharge a battery to the grid instead of for driving a mile. Uh, the second issue is the requirement of the type of chargers. Right now, you're seeing people adopting what's available out there in the market. And once you fit your home with the charger, going and refitting it with another charger becomes a, a, a big expense. Um, and third, I, and I would say this is also a major issue in all of this conversation, um, I learned through my own experience of, of installing and electric things at home and also talking to developers, um, th there is a dearth of electricians in the state of California. And if we try to accelerate and there is nobody to connect, there's no amount of AI data policy that's going to go and connect wires and dig trenches and do the projects for you. And this is still a big, big issue. And when you think about v, V2G, what I learned from these installers that install this technology is that electricians are very, very worried because it's, they are unfamiliar with this technology. There's a huge education component, and I, and I think we are missing that sorely. Um, and you know, if there was somebody from the civil engineering department here, like Martin Fisher, he would say, you know, all the trade unions and so on have been uh, saying and advocating that, look, unless all your plans for investing in technology and so on also invest on education, educating the trades, you're going to run into this issue, and especially for it, it was very interesting. They really, the VGI is a big issue because once the electricity flows the other way and can go into the panel, that electrician's responsibility now has to, he has to do all kinds of calculations he's not familiar with, and that will prevent you from installing this charger. So, uh, but do we need v, VGI? I think we have seen enough studies that it would be great if it's there, but even if it's not there, we can, we can do the job that we need to do. 
And, and I think as Anand said, it, it's really about getting our act together and seeing what is the minimum viable thing that we need to do, putting some policy and incentives in place, and making people align. I think we are not very good at that right now. We have time for one last uh, question. Maybe back there. And apologies for cutting it short, but hopefully the panelists will be available afterwards for answering any remaining questions. Uh, can you, uh, sorry, Daniel Ray from Nostera Ventures. Can you comment on any thoughts of policies around uh, working remote to uh, reduce congestion, reduce driving? Um, is it fair to incentivize companies to allow their employees? It seems like there is a big effect on housing, there's a big effect on commercial uh, real estate, et cetera. So. I'm sure that Susan has quite a few thoughts yeah, about it. Yeah, I've looked at this literature very recently, and it's, it's a little murky because it turns out when you stay home rather than commuting to work, it doesn't mean you're not driving somewhere. So um, evidence suggests that it's kind of a wash. You know, it seems obvious if people stayed home, there'd be less driving, but maybe not. Maybe not. So it's just at different times of the day. Different times of the day. I mean, think about what's happened since COVID. I mean, there's traffic kind of all day long. It's not just peak hours anymore because, well, sometimes people are commuting at different hours than they used to, but also because of the, the non-work travel. Commute travel is 25% of all of our, our travel. So, yeah, we were hopeful. And as long as I've got the mic, I'm going to throw out... Two more words that really should be mentioned here. One is pavements, big issue, and greenhouse gas emissions. And we have a pavement research center that's working on all that. And then safety, another really important thing to, to think about. And then you said something about Stanford doesn't operate anything. Oh, we do operate our bus system. You do operate yes, things. So, so I thought so one I more idea. It doesn't operate anything to... in the grid. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but I did want to throw out that universities can be a test bed yeah. for all kinds of. And we are. Actually. And we, we are. have a project. Yeah. Uh, Marco, yeah. myself, and a couple of others have a project called 24 7 Carbon Free Transportation, where we try to schedule the bus system and the charging so that it is using the least amount of carbon. And also, you know, preventing um, you know, so that you can also use it during outages and so on. So, um, yeah. That note, I know that we could continue talking about uh, these topics for a while, but uh, I had to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, session. Launch, uh, launch is served uh, in Meco Hall. So I'll see you there. And uh, thank you for the panelists. Thank you.